All right, so tonight we're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And initially, I was thinking, you know, gosh, we did all of chapter 1, we could probably do all of chapter 2. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I just don't roll that way. So, um, so let's, let's take a look at just the, the first eight verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting with just verses 1 and 2. He says... For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid, amid much opposition. All right. So when Paul gets to Thessalonica, nothing, nothing was easy. And he got a good dose of what to expect in Europe when he got to Philippi. Uh, because, do you remember the story from Paul and Philippi? He, he winds up getting arrested, uh, taken to the center of the city, and beaten 39 times, and then thrown in jail. Um, so if this is how the nice people of Philippi are, what's going to be waiting for us in Thessalonica? Uh, so he goes, knowing there was going to be uh, difficulty, and it wasn't disappointing. Uh, they had tremendous success, but there was constant conflict and turmoil. In Acts 17, we find that when Paul gets there, as usual, he started in the synagogue. He goes to the Jews first. And as usual, some became believers in Christ. And as usual, this truly angered the Jewish leaders. There was a pattern everywhere he went. Um, and so they were angry and got particularly angry, not just because they lost some members, uh, and not just Jewish members, but also a, a large number of the, um, uh, the Greeks who were coming to the synagogue, the people known as God-fearers, because these people had... Uh, uh, gotten so tired of the immorality and, and the, the shallowness of, of Greco-Roman paganism that they began to look at, at the Jewish God uh, and they liked the Jewish morality. Uh, this was particularly true of a lot of the women uh, of the community. And Thessalonica is in the north, it's in Macedonia. Uh, the, uh, the rules for women in Macedonia were very different than they were almost anywhere else in the Roman Empire. Uh, uh, there's actually a statue uh, still today of a, a Greek woman from that time uh, who was uh, being praised in the inscription on the statue for her uh, uh, benevolence to the community <coughs> and uh, for her uh, generosity um, and talking about what a great businesswoman she was. Um, so it was these people who were leaving the synagogue and going to follow Paul. Well. <coughs> Obviously, that would cause the rabbis some frustration. But what caused them more frustration is that as they're trying to argue with Paul, they can't. He wins the argument every time. Uh, and that makes them all the more crazy. Because when you have lived your whole life with all the knowledge you will ever need in a very neat box, and then this guy comes along and says, nope. And, and knocks your box over and everything spills out and nothing makes sense anymore. You're trying to get it all back together and he just keeps thumping it away. And you want to you wanna argue with him and you can't and you lose and, and you get frustrated and you, you just want to throttle him. And they wanted to throttle him everywhere he went. So the problem is, as the rabbi, you don't have a throttler. And so the, what's the best you can do? Well... What they do with Jesus? Did they bring Jesus before Pontius Pilate and say, you know, he's a, he's a better teacher than we are and we don't like him? No, they said he's making himself out to be a king. Yeah, that's it. He's seditious. He's a traitor. Uh, you know, he's trying to lead us away from our, our true king, Caesar, because we love Caesar so much. Um, so that's what they would do with Paul almost everywhere he went. It's what they did in Thessalonica. It's what he did in 
uh, Corinth, you know, and, and on and on and on. Um, so they, they, they want to go get him. They want to arrest him. They want to drag him before the, the, uh, uh, the court there, the city authorities there in Thessalonica, but they couldn't find him. Don't you just hate that? So they knew where he was staying. He was staying at the home of a, of a man named Jason. Well, they couldn't find Paul, so they grabbed Jason. Poor Jason. Um, the only thing he's guilty of is good hospitality. So he, he's dragged before the city authorities and uh, the rabbis and Jewish leaders are saying, this, this man, Paul, is causing a whole, an uproar in the whole city. And the city authorities said, so is this Paul? Well, no, that's not Paul. That's, that's Jason. Well, why is he here? Well, he's, he's letting Paul stay at his house. And um, so he must be guilty of something. And so they um, um, really didn't want to get involved in, in this kind of thing. They wanted to kind of placate everybody. So they, they charged Jason a fine for disturbing the peace and sent him on his way. Um, so Jason goes and finds Paul and says, you know, it might be good for you to get out of town tonight. And so off he goes. Um, so the whole town is in an uproar when Paul leaves. He gets all the way down to Corinth where Timothy and, and Silas find him. And as he's writing back to them that we saw in chapter one, he's praising them for how they received the gospel of Jesus Christ with such joy, joy, even while there was all of this tribulation and anger and furor going on around them. They received it with joy. So Paul reminds them here that they all knew of all that he had suffered previously in Philippi and that he knew that there would be opposition when he got to Thessalonica, but that his only prayer was that God would give him boldness to speak the gospel. Lord, just give me boldness to speak the gospel. But just because Paul left town didn't mean that things quieted down and seems that Paul's enemies only stepped up their attacks once he was gone. So here in 1 Thessalonians, Paul is counterpunching against his enemies and against his critics. Now that Timothy and Silas have come back and found him and have said, you need to know what's going on. Well, here in verse 3, we get a taste of what's happening back with the church of the Thessalonians. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. For our exhortation, our preaching, our message does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. Three charges that because they're all just kind of lumped in verse three, it's easy for us just to read over. Error. Some translations may use the word delusion. Um, Paul's critics I mean, when you can't argue somebody down, what do you do? Well, you can say that, well, you're just wrong. That's all it is to it. You're just, you're just wrong. Or, you're nuts. You're crazy. Um, and so, it's, it's error or delusion. And his enemies had two angles that they could approach from here, either from the Greek perspective about life after death, because they didn't have the idea of life after death. He went to... Hades, and that was it. I mean, you're, you're there in this sort of non-living, non-dead state of something. You know, they, they weren't real sure. But, I mean, life, real life, you know, where, where you're more alive in heaven than you are on earth? No, no, no. Only somebody crazy would believe that. Or the Jewish perspective uh, about, uh, let's see, the son of a carpenter from Nazareth, you're saying, is the Messiah and the Savior of the world. Right. Oh, you are nuts. Um, you know, because we all know that nothing good can come out of Galilee, for crying out loud. And he's the son of a carpenter. Well, he's not even the son of a prophet. Uh, and you think he's the Savior of the world. So they would say, you know, either you're, either you're just flat wrong, you, you misread the Bible somehow, or you're crazy. And, uh, and we don't need any more crazy people here. We got enough uh, sitting there in, uh, in high office. All right, so the second one was impurity. 
We did not, uh, our exhortation does not come from error or impurity. Well, here's your Greek word for the day. The Greek word here is akatharsia, um, which was often used to refer to sexual impurity. Well, so this is kind of what they were doing. You know, we'll, we'll sling that mud at them. Um, but again, be, because as we saw in uh, 1 John, we know that there were a lot of traveling teachers who had no scruples whatsoever. Um, and the Gnostic traveling preachers, they could sound Christian. They could even wear a toga with a little fish on the logo, you know, uh, saying, well, yes, I'm a Christian. Yeah. Uh, and they're teaching a gospel that is completely different. And for the Gnostics, if you recall from our study of, of John's letters, when it comes to food or sex or drinking or anything that has to do with the body, well, just anything goes because for the, these people, the body was not important. All that was important was that your spirit stay pure. You can do whatever you want, live however you want, uh, be as big of a glutton as you want, but as long as your spirit is pure, it's all good. This is what they were preaching. Well, there's a certain appeal to all of that. And, and you know, so when they come talking about God's love and Paul comes talking about God's love, Paul means something very different from them. Uh, and that's not, as we said, when we were talking about uh, first, second, third John. It's not a thing that we need to ignore either, because what we hear out there is not the Christian message, even though it may look like it, sound like it. When they talk about love, they mean something very, very different. Um, also, another issue here with the impurity question is that both the Jews and the Greeks had some trouble um, with the language of the early church. Later, we'll see in, um, at the end, in chapter 5, verse 26, Paul asks that the church greet one another with a holy kiss. What now? Greet how? Not the holy handshake, but the holy kiss. What kind of people are you? And you know, when Christians got married, that meant that Christian brothers and sisters got married. Well, what kind of people are these? I wouldn't, you know, heavens to Betsy, brothers and sisters are all getting married here. So there was, there was a constant slander on the church in terms of what really went on in the love feast they were having and, and so forth. Um, because again, it's language, even as sophisticated of a language as, as the Greeks. Um, uh, it was easy for them to take a word and, and twist it. Uh, because again, what church means when we talk about love means something very different. Now, just for fun, um, some of you know uh, Charles Rossell, who was a longtime pastor at First Baptist in Leesburg. His son was a member here at Sweetwater for a while. Um, Charles, his first Sunday, uh, at Leesburg tells the story of how he thought it was the stiffest, most uptight church he'd ever seen in his life. So just spontaneously at the end of the service, he asked them all to, uh, uh, to greet one another with a hug before they left. And he got a phone call uh, that afternoon from a deacon who first, when Charles answered the phone, the deacon said, I thought you were a man of scripture a godly man of the Bible. And Charles said, I assure you I am. He said, then why did you have us do that unscriptural thing today? Actually having to hug people. Nothing in the Bible about that whatsoever. And if that's the way you're going to be, I'll see to it. You ain't here long. And Charles said, you know, you're, you're right. Let me, let me ponder that. Let me pray on that. But thank you for your call. And so the next week, Charles gets up and apologizes to the church for being unbiblical, unscriptural, because he says... We are to greet one another with the holy kiss. So please kiss at least three people before you leave. <laughs> they didn't know about COVID. You know. <laughs> the third charge here is deceit in verse 3, the end of verse 3. It's not by impurity or by way of deceit. Uh, here the charge is that Paul is in it just for personal gain, either money or power or both. The idea is that Paul comes with a message of a glorious life after death, of freedom and forgiveness in this life, and that he's selling nothing more than some sort of theological Brooklyn Bridge. Because you can't show them heaven, right? 
you know, uh, you can't show them Jesus. Um, and so, so Paul says here, you know, for the money. This is why he was so adamant about always providing his own support wherever he went, working as a tent maker, uh, so that he did not have to ask anybody for a dime or a shekel. So, uh, you know, he wanted to make sure that all of these charges get shot down in verses 4 through 8. But, he says in verse 4, just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor do we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. But we prove to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children, having so fond an affection for you that we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have become so very dear to us. So Paul categorically denies all of these charges. He argues that it is God who has entrusted his message to him, and that God is the only one he seeks to please. Um, Paul says, when I'm preaching, I've only got an audience of one. And that's, that ought to be the attitude of every Sunday school teacher, every Bible study teacher, every, every, every preacher, anywhere. You really only got an audience of one. Um, and as long as you're on target with what you're saying to please the one you've got to please, if nobody else gets it, if nobody else likes it, well, you know, that's, that's probably their, their problem. In, uh, in the 21st century and others, uh, selling some theological work on bridge, that's not like selling some guy like Hitchens back when he was still alive or Bill Maher would say, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, they, yeah. They just say, oh, it's, it's hooey. They don't. Right. They can't spell Bible, but they're an expert on it. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, uh, I, uh, I always had kind of a love hate relationship with the TV show The West Wing. Uh, I loved the way that they uh, uh, did such a wonderful job of giving you an insight of what life is like inside the White House. But occasionally, Bobby, they would do exactly what you're talking about, where they, they build sort of this. Um, uh, Christian biblical scarecrow, and just just for the purpose of knocking it over, uh, there there's a classic scene where uh, the the, uh, the president meets a, uh, a pro life uh, congressperson, and just goes up one side of them and down the other with those exactly what you were saying, you know, as if he really knows the Bible. He's just spouting things he's heard from someone else. Uh, and it would be so easy to you know, refute everything he said, but the writers of the script kept the pro-life uh, congressperson quiet and defeated. Um, and it just drives me crazy when they do stuff like that. Um, uh, so, you know, Paul's here is saying, look, I'm just going to tell you the truth. What you do with it is, is between you and God. Uh, because the only thing God's holding me accountable for is not how you receive it, but how true I am to what he gave me. That's, that's the key. Rogers? I think it's extremely important when you're witnessing to realize yeah. that, that you are talking to another person, but you're actually a conduit. Yeah. From up. Absolutely. And you've got, you're, you're only caring about doing what he says. As opposed to, mm -hmm. and you get all kinds of, of uh, and since I've tried to do some of this, you get reactions. What's yeah. In, what's in it for you? Right. And that's what Paul, that's what they want to know with Paul. You're in for the money? Yeah. Um, so, you know, he tells them, look, it's God that gave you the message. God's the one, the only one I'm trying to please. I'm not, I didn't come trying to please you with flattering speech or anything. I've only got an audience of one. Secondly, he reminds them that on that point that when they came, they didn't try to flatter anyone. They didn't come asking for money or even suggesting the idea. He said, just think about it. 
so that the message was given to them, not trying to schmooze them or getting money out of them in any way. Paul was always adamant on this. Now, um, one of the earliest books ever published, uh, and the earliest book uh, that the church ever published, was a little book uh, known as the Didache. Uh, and it was, it was simply entitled the Didache, the Teachings of the Twelve Apostles. Um, and they found some kind of bound copies of this that don't go quite back to the first century. Uh, but they know from other writings around that time that the book was, was already circulating in the church. And it did so because uh, the church needed uh, some guidelines and they needed some basic uh, key points to hold on to. I mean, it's, it's a little book. It's not big. Uh, so you can't put everything in there. But it had the basic teachings of the faith. Who was Jesus? But it also had some practical points for the young church to follow, including how to treat traveling preachers. So it said, if a traveling preacher asked to stay for a day or two and never asked for money, then they were to be treated as genuine. You know, treat them well, do, do them well. Uh, if you want to give them money, fine. If you want to give them food, fine. But as long as they don't ask for it. On the other hand, if they ask to stay for a third day or longer, or if they ask for money, or heaven forbid both, then you need to treat them as false prophets and kick them out. Um, you know, they're, they're, just, they're just trying to take advantage of you. Hard to imagine that there would be people that would try to take advantage of the generosity of the church. I know you're shocked to hear it. Um, and so even in the very first century, people were aware that there were those people who would try to use the goodness of the church for ill-gotten gain and for moral purposes. And they, the, so one of the reasons for writing this little book was to help the church try to see the wolves in sheep clothing, uh, try not to be taken advantage of, try not to be misled, because remember as we looked particularly in 2nd and 3rd John, that's exactly what the problem was. Uh, the church had been terribly misled by these people. And so, um, you know, the, this little book was written to be able to help address that. Who wrote it? You got to go to heaven to find out. Uh, you know, certainly uh, Paul likely had some contribution to it. Certainly John probably had some contribution to it. Um, uh, you know, probably James back in Jerusalem there had... had uh, uh, some to it. it. It originated, you first, their references to it are late first century, so about the time of the book of Revelation. Um, but you can well imagine it didn't just suddenly come out, you know, from um, uh, Lifeway. Mm -hmm. It was something that was sort of pieced together over time uh, until someone said, you know, if we put all this together in one book, that would be good to be able to circulate out amongst the churches. Paul said he did not try to elevate himself. He did not try to elevate himself. Um, we, uh, we did not seek glory from men in verse 6, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. Um, and that's, again, that's always a temptation. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this was my pastor growing up telling my fiancé, Okay, after you marry Buddy, your number one job is to make sure that he never, ever gets put up on a pedestal. You can knock him down all you want. Um, one of uh, the favorite jokes around our house for a long time was the story of a young preacher who preached a sermon one day. About 30 people joined the church, and he was feeling pretty good. So at lunch, he goes home, and you know, after lunch is over, he's eating some dessert, and he says... Honey, how many great preachers do you think there truly are in America today? And his wife says, one less than you think. <laughs> uh, that's the thing, you know. And um, one of the big issues today uh, is that's in the, in the media almost every week, it seems like, is another celebrity preacher 
comes crashing down. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Um, I've known, you know, it's, it's not unusual for a, a church to uh, give their pastor a, a membership to the local country club, but folks, I've, I've been invited to lunch with some pastors where they're at the club. I mean, um, uh, there was a, a, a private dining club in Atlanta that maybe the CEO of Georgia Pacific uh, would uh, have a membership at, or the senior partner of King and Spalding uh, would have a membership at, and this pastor's church made sure that he had a membership there. Okay, and I'm thinking, I don't know what fork to use. <laughs> you know, I don't, you know, I have absolutely no business being here at all. You know, this is, this is what Paul is, is saying. I, I'm not that guy. I didn't come to you that way. I could have. I mean, you can well imagine Paul saying, hey, look, I had a personal conversation, a close encounter with the risen Jesus Christ. My eyes have never been the same. And I have been given a message, and I have been given power by Christ. I can do miracles. So you all need to bow down. Yeah, he could have done that, and certainly there's a lot of preachers who, uh, you know, who think that they've got that kind of game going on too. But Paul never did that. For Paul, it was never about him. He was just the messenger. It was all about the message. Um, in Corinthians, in yeah. Corinthians, doesn't Paul write them, uh, I could have come to you with telling you of this knowledge that I have and this and this, but all yeah. that I shared was Christ and him crucified. That's, that's it. It's all about the message and the one who gave it. Um, you know, well, he, he basically tells the Corinthians, Look, I'm, I'm a better Christian than all of you people, but so what? You know, I can, you, some of you over there speaking in tongues, I can do it blindfolded. Yeah. <laughs> so what? You know, it's not about that. It's not about, you know, it's just about the message and the one who gave it. Because um, he goes on to say, not that I came to you, but that our message came to you. Our message came to you. And this is to be a good thing for every young seminary student to learn. Uh, it also seems to suggest that Paul was being accused of, of something of being a, a dictator. Uh, he counters this by saying that he came to the Thessalonians like a new mother loves and cares for her baby. Um, uh, but any good mother is going to have a certain measure of discipline for her children. Um, and you do it with great affection and tenderness, and you do it with the best interest of the child at heart. Um, I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many of you have let a, a two-month-old cry themselves to sleep? Uh-huh, yeah. Because what they learn is, if I cry a little bit, they'll come. They'll come see about me. They'll bring me a bottle or something. And so we're going to find out who's in charge of this house right now. And, um, uh, and so, you know, I, there, were, there were times where I'd go visit a family, and I'd walk in, and the baby is just wailing in the back bedroom. And the mom and dad are like, hi, how are you? Come on in, sit in. Do you need to go see about the baby? No, no, no. She'll be asleep in 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, we do this every night. Yeah. Um, so the baby, in his best language skills it can come up with going, is my parents don't love me. They won't come when I'm crying. Oh, yeah. Um, no, they do love you, and they know that you should have been asleep 45 minutes ago, so... Quit crying and get to sleep. Um, so there's a certain measure of discipline that a good mother has, but the good mother does it with affection and tenderness. And Paul says that he poured love into them. 
that he poured the gospel of God into them. Indeed, he says, we poured our very lives into you. I love verse 9, or verse 8. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have become very dear to us. Um, that's, uh, that's one of the things uh, uh, you hear good, good teachers say, or, or you hear about good teachers, that they poured themselves into their students. Um, you know, a, a coach who pours himself into his players. Um, when uh, you, some of you may have heard that uh, once upon a time in the South, um, black folk couldn't hang out with white folk. Um, and so there was this basketball coach at the University of North Carolina by the name of Dean Smith. And Coach Smith went up to New York and recruited a big power forward, young big black man from New York, and Charlie Scott to come down to Chapel Hill to play for North Carolina. And um, the very first time they went to Winston-Salem to play Wake Forest, the hotel manager would not let Charlie Scott play or stay in the hotel. Now it's not a long drive from Chapel Hill to Winston-Salem. Um, so when the hotel manager wouldn't let the black player stay at the hotel, Coach Smith put everybody back on the bus and they rode back to Chapel Hill. And then the next day they got up early and drove back to Winston-Salem and played the basketball game. Um, years later, somebody asked Charlie Scott, why in the world <laughs> Would you leave New York when you could have gone to Syracuse or any other school up here? Why in the world would you go down to North Carolina to play basketball? And he said, because of Dean Smith. He said, Coach Smith didn't coach basketball players. Coach Smith made young men. And that's why I play basketball at North Carolina. Um, that's a coach who pours himself into his players. And Paul is saying, this is what I've done with you. I love you so much. I want to see you accomplish so much. I want you to grow so much. I'm, I, I just want to pour myself into you so that you can become the disciples for Jesus Christ the same way Coach Smith wanted that young man to become not just a ball player, but a, a, a good young adult young man. And he did. And he did, yeah. Jerry? That pouring yourself into someone, isn't that basically the idea of mentoring? Sure it is. Sure it is. But there's an intimacy that goes a little maybe a step further than the way that most of the time we think about mentoring. Uh, mentoring has almost become a little too formal in our culture. Um, there, there's an intimacy here where it's not just mind to mind, you know, but it's heart to heart, yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, that's what Coach Smith did with his players, and, you know, that's what uh, uh, Paul's, Paul's doing here with the people of uh, Thessalonica. I just poured myself into you. Um, so proud of you. That is a good thing. So, and, yeah, and, and that's, and again, uh, you know, what, what makes a good teacher? Uh, what makes a good Sunday school teacher? Um, there was a, a guy who was a lawyer, uh, the last church I was a youth minister, he, he taught seventh grade boys. Why in the world anybody would want to teach seventh grade boys, I don't know, but he, he taught seventh grade boys for 25, 30 years. And um, I love the man. Um, the Sahara Desert was not more dry than he was. <coughs> but those boys would go to war for him every year. And, and the sixth grade boys couldn't wait to get to his class. Um, why? Because he poured himself into those kids. And so if you ask any of them now, you know, name one lesson that he ever taught you, they couldn't tell you. They, they couldn't tell you one thing he, from the Bible that he ever taught them. But they could say, he loved me. You know, that's, that's the key. That's the key. All right, so we spent, way, as Kathy would say, and I'm sure she is, <laughs> we spent way too much time talking about her earlier. 
so it is starting to get late. Uh, so let's uh, uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll we'll close our Bible study time, and um, uh, get on to the prayer time. Father, I thank you so much for this truth from Scripture. Uh, Lord, if you if you take a stand for Christ, people are going to throw mud at you. They're going to say, well, you're crazy, you're wrong. They're going to try to say, well, you're just, you know, you're using this to get something, money, power, position, something. Or that, you know, you're just using this to be able to... Uh, uh, kind of wind your way into people's lives, you know, for impure reasons. Well, you know, the only answer is to live a life where there's nothing really that's going to stick. Uh, you, you, you're clearly not in it for the money. You, you are always cautious and careful uh, never to be able to put yourself in a, in a position where anybody could say anything negative and uh, you, you constantly point away from yourself to the message and the message, the one that gave you that message, Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so, Father, thank you for the example that Paul set, not only of what not to do, but also what to do. How to be able to love people, mentor them by just pouring yourself into them. Um, to be able to disciple them with all the love and nurture of a young mother. And so, Father, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for the truth of your word. Be with us, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen.